Good day. It's Thursday, May the 13th. I'm Martin Gagel with Radius Research. Today, we're joined by Frederick Dugray, CEO of H2O Innovations. Today, H2O Innovations announced their Q3 fiscal 2021 financial results for the end of March. The results seem solid with revenue growth, margin expansion, and good free cash flow. Frederick, thanks for joining us today. Could you just go over some of the key uh, highlights of the, the quarter? Well, thanks for having me, Martin. It's a pleasure. Well, super, super happy and proud of these results that we're presenting for the third quarter. Um, I think there's a lot to be said about this quarter. Uh, yes, as you mentioned, between the margin expansion, the EBITDA reaching a new high of $4.5 million, the free cash also generated from from our operations, I mean, quite sustained. We're talking here about 10.2 million generated in the course of the quarter. So obviously this huge amount of cash generated from the operation allows us to reduce our debt. And as we reduce our debts and we have more cash in the end, it opens up the opportunities to do a lot more things afterwards. That's great. And yeah, your net debt went down to what? I believe three, like from $10 million down to uh, $3 million. So like, for a company your size, that's virtually close to being debt free. Exactly, exactly. So, finger crossed. I think everything indicates that if we continue in the same path um, by June thirtieth, by the end of our fiscal year, we should be now, as you said, debt free. Um, so, so again, as I said, by being debt free, it means that yes, we're in good financial situation. Uh, we can take that money to reinvest and execute our three-year plan which essentially will be around you know, a couple of things. I mean, we want to grow the business organically. So I think we'll need to reinvest into our sales and, and marketing functions to, to further grow the business and have more feet to the ground to, to capture more sales, uh, both into the, 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 the specialty products, the o and and also the, the, the water and wastewater project as well. And finally, to reinvest also into product innovation. I think there's a lot to be done. Our team is currently working on really, really cool and good stuff that we expect will, will impact positively the coming quarters. And, and finally, I mean, continue to do what we have been doing, acquired small tuck-ins companies to further leverage the business and grow the business. So we're still on the look for that. And because we'll have a solid balance sheet, uh, we'll be able to put these dollars at play and, and leverage it you know, uh, moderately. So your EBITDA margin was over 11%, and that, that puts you sort of ahead of your, uh, your I guess, your three-year plan there. So are you going to sort of keep pushing on that EBITDA expansion, or now that you've got that sort of extra room, you've talked about reinvesting, uh, maybe push on product development and maybe sales and marketing to uh, help grow the business as opposed to kind of harvest it? Yeah. Well, as you said, we're, we're slightly ahead of our plan. It looks like uh, everything is, is in line to hit this, uh, this target of 11 plus, you know, that we have set for the three-year plan. Um, so, so what we would like to do instead of, of maybe accelerating our expansion on the margin is more to reinvest into growth. I mean, I've mentioned it before, the, the, the water industry itself is huge. I mean, we're talking here about a, an annual industry of $840 billion a year. An H2O addressable market is about $4.5 billion a year. So we are a $150 million company. So there's a lot to be done, a lot to be captured moving forward. So I think that today, um, because we can enjoy now being a double digit EBITDA above 11%, to be able to reallocate these dollars, reinvest these dollars into organic growth, I think is a, is a smart move. And this is what we're going to do. All right. Uh, there are a couple of sort of macro factors that are really beyond your uh, your control are both like the foreign exchange, the Canadian dollars done uh, well relative to the US, that can affect both your revenues and your cost of goods sold, depending on where your revenues and your expenses are, are kind of priced. In. And then just to tuck into that as well, a lot of talk about inflation. Um, and I don't know on a big picture, labor I'm guessing is maybe your biggest expense line, but you've also got like heavy equipment behind you and so forth. So could you just talk about all those things that I threw at you there? Sure, absolutely. So first, uh, foreign exchange. As you said, I mean, it's a, it's a thing that we don't control. Um, we have a, a great portion of our revenues that are in US dollar or, or reporting currency is in Canadian dollars. Um, so our current exposure, I mean, to, to make a rule of thumb is that for every cent uh, of fluctuation into the US dollar versus the Canadian dollars, it has an impact of $200,000 on our revenue line and an impact, which is way smaller, 
of $40,000 on our EBITDA line. So it, it is way less, you know, when you look at it for the EBITDA because we are somehow naturally the edge with expenses that we have in the U.S. We have a large number of employees uh, also in the U.S. or manufacturing going in the U.S. So this has a tendency to edge a little bit uh, the current exposure that we have on the currency. Uh, however, yes, it had an impact. I mean, if you look at last year versus this year, we're talking more or less a difference of seven cents into our, our reporting between, you know, last year, third quarter, this year, third quarter. So seven cents fluctuation at more or less $200,000 impact deflated the top line compared to what it should be and impacted proportionally as well at $40,000 $40, per percent um, of fluctuation, the EBITDA line. So again, I think, you know, it's momentarily, I think the, the, the economy right now in the U.S., is, is going strong. I mean, uh, we're seeing, you know, investment. I mean, the, the, the industries are out there working and, and, and we should see the, the, the US dollar coming back to, to more normal, but in the coming months and quarters, it may remain to this level. So I think though, it's a huge opportunity for us because, you know, our playground for acquisitions as we have done in the past, most likely is in the US. So because now we have a strong balance sheet and we're going to end our fiscal year with such strong balance sheet, and because now we have a, a much higher currency allowing us to pay for a business that we're going to acquire in the US a much cheaper price, we should take advantage of that. And this is what we're going to do as well. So it plays both ways. I mean, we could buy cheaper and, and yes, it impacted a little bit the revenue and the EBITDA performance. You Oh, Sorry, go up, to, the second fold, to the second fold of your questions regarding uh, the inflation. Um, again, something that we don't control, we are exposed to some inflation into our cost. Um, the labor, I will say, which is an important expense for us, is being mitigated somehow by the fact that we have provisions on CIP, CPI adjustment into some of our contracts, operation and maintenance contracts we have in the U.S., so these provisions allowing us to mitigate um, this inflation, allowing us to control the cost for the labor as well. Uh, on the other end, for the, for the goods itself, the material, yes, there are some increase, mostly around the stainless steel and, and, and related products, for example. So what we're doing is that right now, obviously, we're passing on this increase as much as we can to the customer. Uh, so this also mitigates uh, the exposure that we have. And, and right now, for the other business lines, such as the chemicals, we have been fortunate enough that with the current ingredients and raw material that we use to make the chemicals, our exposure was very, very limited. So we can still enjoy the nice and, and very accurate margins that we have. All right. Since you mentioned on the M&A with the, the currency and your, your share price uh, has done well over the last uh, year, great comparable uh, in terms of share price, you've got a lot better currency for U.S. acquisitions. Are, you mentioned tuck-in acquisitions. Would they be generally on the smaller kind of tuck-in ones or could, could we expect a possibility of a bigger, more kind of transformational uh, one going forward? Well, as we presented in the three-year plan, uh, we intend to do four tuck-ins of, let's say, size that will be ideally between, let's say, 10 to $20 million revenue size. So this is what we define as tuck-ins. Um, these tuck-ins should be done without dilution for the shoulders because of the current balance sheet that we have and the money we have and the access to the capital we have internally. Um, we have done one so far, as we have announced on February 1st for the acquisition of GMP in Spain. Um, there's three more that we would like to do within the next three years, so bringing us to the end of 2023. However, um, we want to remain opportunistic for much bigger transactions where, yes, we will need then uh, access to the capital, access to equity, and then we could use, as you said, the currency, the stock currency that we have, which is much stronger than it was a year ago. Uh, but right now, our first plan is to go for the small tuck-ins and limit dilution for the shareholders. As you're a bigger company and much more stable with more pillars of business, um, and let's say you do a big acquisition, how much debt on, let's say, a debt to EBITDA basis or, or, or in cash flow, uh, how high would you be willing to sort of put that up in a temporary manner to do an acquisition and then pay it down with uh, the free cash flow going forward? Well, for us, I mean, we feel comfortable in doing it, you know, to a... Um, 
a level of 2.5, let's say stretch to three times the, the, the debt to EBITDA uh, ratio, the net debt to EBITDA ratio. This is where we feel that um, we will remain comfortable. Um, again, we want to be in a position where if we do an acquisition, it's because it will be accurate without being not able to invest into the other business lines that we have to support them for the growth. I don't want to end up in a situation where we stretch ourselves too thin and then we're not capable of making the investment into the other business lines we have to support their growth, to support product innovation. So we believe that that 2.5 to three times net debt to EBITDA, it's comfortable. And, and that gives us you know, sufficient room to, uh, to make this acquisition. All right. Um, on the, the market side, there's a lot of talk about uh, Biden's uh, infrastructure plan. Uh, could you talk, it's still early stage and it takes a while for those to roll out. Can you, uh, I don't know, how predominant do you know is a water in their infrastructure plans? And then as well, are, are there big infrastructure plans in Europe or South America that could help uh, be a, a tailwind to you guys? Well, as you said, it's a little bit early. So so we welcome it in a broad vision and broad sense because we, we like to see investment being done into our sector, right? I mean, upgrading these infrastructure, uh, building new infrastructure, addressing more of the problematic around water reuse and water scarcity is all good things. However, how will we spend the $30 billion in the coming years? I think it's a little bit early to see um, how it will impact, you know, in the next quarter or so, the, the H2O. But in general, what we saw in the past when uh, President Obama in 2008 did a similar investment into the infrastructure, not as big as this one, but there was also stimulus money. Um, we saw money being deployed over four years. So, so it took a certain time before it started to impact H2O. We started to, to see these projects, you know, uh, moving above ground, and, but it will happen. So, so we still welcome that very nicely. I think in South America, uh, we'll see also opportunities that government or will invest into uh, water reuse more and more. Uh, and this is an area of focus that, uh, that we want to do and see what we can do there. All right. Um, and how is the Canada just kind of selfishly curious a, for your business opportunities, but like how well is Canada sort of deploying new infrastructure more specifically on, on the water side? Well, Canada so far, it's, it's kind of steady growth. I mean, we, we, we're seeing more and more opportunities, I would say, though, on the First Nation side. Um, this is something that we have been working on. There was numerous opportunities that uh, and numerous projects we delivered in the past for First Nations across Canada. Um, so, so this is something that we're, we're still on the look. This is probably the, the new thing. Um, otherwise, I mean, we're pursuing, you know, the Canadian market as we used to. I mean, we shouldn't expect, you know, significant increase in the Canadian market. Uh, it's still relatively small compared to the other uh, market of our neighbor, right, in the south. So 35, 36 million population. Um, it's a big country, but it's a small population. So our focus really is more in the U.S., but we remain very opportunistic and present in the Canadian market. I mean, we just secured a nice uh, operation and maintenance contract for a new uh, food and beverage industrial customers in, around Alberta. So uh, uh, just outside of Calgary. Um, we'll be able to provide the operation and maintenance service contract for a 1 million gallons per day MBR plant for this industrial customer. So there are opportunities. Um, we're just going to continue to harvest and, uh, and, in, and go after it. We're hopefully, at least in North America, getting into a better COVID environment where things aren't so locked down, although... Uh, out east, not so much right now, but hopefully as we get vaccinated and things improve, uh, how is, are, like, can you just briefly comment on, like, the, there's the initial shock of COVID, everything kind of shut down, now people are trying to operate as usual. Do you see businesses um, making decisions faster, spending faster, are you going to spend more money on travel now, or, or like, what are the good and bad of uh, your business as uh, ho COVID hopefully gets better well the good news um, uh, now a year ago that we have been into this now um, is that we haven't seen any deterioration into our business because of covid so so we have maintained our customer we have maintained our business because of the recurrent nature and because of the essential services that we're providing right 
So because of that, we have enjoyed um, a continuity of operations, a continuity of services, continuity of cash flow and revenues. Um, moving forward, I think though we have adapted ourselves with new marketing practices, let's put it this way. Um, we're going to travel again for sure, but I don't think we're going to travel as we used to. Um, we're going to do things differently with our customers. We're going to still see them, but maybe at a different frequency. So at the end, there was good thing around it uh, that allows us to, to, to do things differently, uh, be more efficient. I, I think that will remain, but yes, travel will pick up again and then we're going to visit customers again. All right, uh, we're just trying to keep this uh, conversation uh, brief here. Are there any aspects of the, the business, anything you wanna highlight maybe out of one of your uh, divisions, the WTS or the, the specialty products or O&M on how those operated or how you see where, where the focus maybe should be of the business uh, going forward? Yeah, I mean, um, if I may review a little bit uh, each of the three pillars on, on, on our key highlights. So, on the WTS side, it's really, really nice to see, you know, revenue ramping up finally. We were saying that in previous quarter, uh, that we're going to get busy. It's coming, it's coming. And now finally it's happening. It's starting to hit our PL. So this is really nice. It will remain like that for a while. We have a great number of projects in the backlog that are currently on, on their engineering phase. So as they move to the fabrication and commissioning phase, it will allow us to continue to ramp up revenue. So this is really nice. Most more diversification also with more industrial customers. Um, on the specialty products, on the specialty products, the chemical will continue to be super, super strong, both PWT and Genesis with GMP as well. So we're currently working on the consolidation of this group altogether to gain efficiency and, and gain more cohesion within the group. Um, with Piedmont, we saw a momentarily kind of slowdown this year in the desalination industry in general partially due to the COVID. So there was some slowdown in the construction uh, of new desalination plant and mostly in the Middle East. Uh, however, Piedmont is currently working on new products uh, that we want to diversify the product offering. Um, and hopefully these are will be steps that will allow us to, to see the business ramp up. And, and just to mention that the Maple Division had a fantastic, fantastic season this year. Again, this, this division surprises us every year with, uh, with amazing growth, uh, amazing product innovation. Um, so they had still a good year and we're reinvesting into uh, growing our manufacturing capabilities because I mean, the good, good problem is that we miss a couple of sales and a couple of revenue because we had limited capabilities into our manufacturing facilities. So this will take care of that moving forward. And finally on the operation maintenance, if I may, um, operation and maintenance, well, uh, still focused to grow organically and, and renew these important customers uh, that we have. Um, I think we have done a fabulous job in consolidating the business. The rebranding we have announced in Q2 is starting to pay off really, really nicely. We're gaining eff operational efficiency, allowing us to improve the margins. Um, so we have a solid team capturing and doing a fantastic job to maintain you know, these infrastructures. All right, on your conference call today with the, the analyst, you, you made some comments about, or maybe it was in, the, in your notes uh, on the financials, on the WTS side, targeting projects with higher margins. And because the, the WTS business is, it, it's a lumpy business with big projects. And I believe it's on the lower side of your, your, your margin, but it, it's a get, good, it get, gets, generates other business opportunities for you as well in the market. What, what, how do you target sort of higher margin business opportunities? Are those like different niches, like the industrial side, or are they bigger projects or smaller projects? Or, or how do you sort of go about finding those better margin ones? Well, usually the industrial projects comes with a higher margin profile because you can better sell your value proposition. You can package more different solutions within your offering. Um, when it's public bid, municipal bid, um, usually it's, um, it's, it's more uh, separated into different pieces. So, so margin is more under pressure. Um, usually also you're competing with a larger number of players, pushing some, putting some pressure on the margins. So I think it needs to have the right balance in a sense that, yes, we want to pursue more in the soil opportunities, but we want to remain active into the municipal arena as well. Uh, there are opportunities out there in municipalities where you, when you find it, 
And when you have the right project delivery as well approach, uh, you'll be able to secure really good margin as well. So I hate to say that, but it's there's no general rule you could apply. You need to look at it per project basis. There are some municipal projects that are coming up at great margins that we're going to pursue. There are other ones where it's, it's open to anyone. Uh, you can end up with eight bidders on a bid, and then suddenly the pressure will be terrible on, on the margin. So this is not, not the kind of thing you want to do. It builds volume, but at the end, you know, it's, it's, it's not accurate to us. So, well, and I guess, sorry, in, in the public space, the, the, municipal, the government agencies have to sort of just go with the lowest bidder. They put out their RFP and, and they, that with your an industrial or sort of more a private approach, they can weigh everything. So oh, these guys have better service. Yeah, we pay them a bit more, but we see greater value in it. Is that part of how you get the better margins on uh, those kind of projects? Yes. But as you said, it. I mean, the governmental agencies or municipalities, they don't necessarily have to select the lowest bidder, right? Okay. So, so, so they, they have to come to a selection. Prices is, is one point that they should, they should consider, obviously. But what about the experience? What about the value proposition? What about the energy consumption? What about the footprint? So there's a lot of other criteria that if a consultant engineer is doing his job properly, should be able to identify and determine, for example, what is the best life cycle cost analysis for this plant, right? Is the municipality, because we are taxpayer, right? So do we want to make sure that at the end we select the cheapest one, and then we're going to pay the high price for the maintaining of this asset for the next 20 years? Or we want to take that into account, right? So I think that more and more there's education being done and efforts being done by consultant engineers to try to walk away from this low bid kind of perception, right? So, but it's a matter of time, it's a matter of education, it's a matter of, of, of showing the success and the value it brings also to the customer, but it's happening. And I guess as you get bigger and more well-known, there's hopefully more brand value when you make bids like, oh, H2O, they do quality work where they're, they're not sort of a low bidder sort of. Exactly. And, and I think we have gained this kind of respect within the industry. Right now, I mean, consultant engineers are calling us. They want us to bid on projects. They know that what we bring in terms of value, quality. Uh, they know that most likely we're, we're not going to be the lowest bidder. So, so if, if it is, you know, if the scoring sheet at the end is driven by cost only, well, we may just say, no, we're not going to bid. So, so there, there is this pushback also that needs to happen, but I think we need to stand on our two feet now after 20 years of existence and believe in what we're doing. And, and yeah, I mean, we're, we're not here to do things for free, right? We have shoulders and, and that's the end game. All right, all right. Well, uh, should we wrap it up here? Or is there any final comments you want to uh, make? Well, I think, I think we covered a lot. Uh, really happy again and proud of this performance. Um, it's, it's heading well towards uh, the fourth quarter and we should finish the year strong uh, with a fantastic year. And again, well aligned for our three-year plan. All right. And just to be clear, your year end is the end of June. And, right. and then we'll be seeing your uh, year end results in what, end of July, beginning of August or something like that? So we have 90 days to reduce uh, our financials. So it will be at the end of September. Oh, okay. That's right. All right. Okay. Well, we'll 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 have it by by then. That's great. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Frederick. You're very welcome, Martin. Have a good day. Cheers. Cheers. Bye bye.